In today's lecture, we will talk about density functional theory, what it is and which kind of density we will be discussing. Up to now, we've been trying to describe the behavior of solid states of materials using the description of atoms and electrons. The um, entities that we are describing can be seen as a collection of atomic nuclei and electrons. They are all in this uh, crystalline back, as I put it here. And we did one very important, um, one very important uh, assumption. We have applied so-called uh, Born-Oppenheimer approximation, in which we separated the electrons from atomic nuclei. This allowed us to hugely simplify the energy terms that we needed to include in the Schrodinger equation that we did last week. We are still left with a set of electrons that need to be treated quantum mechanically. We have developed last week um, two conceptual steps in which we spoke about Hartree method and later on about Hartree Fock method how we can actually solve this many body electronic problem. We haven't explicitly spoken about it last week, but we had it at the beginning of this course uh, when we discussed the interactions between nuclei and their behavior that can be conveniently described at the atomistic modeling or molecular modeling level with uh, electrons providing the interaction between these nuclei. We would then treat these nuclei in principle classically. Uh, we apply the Newtonian mechanics and we use this, for example, to describe the phonons in uh, metals or in, in solid states. Good, so let's say this is something that we can do. And for this part, for the left-hand side part, we have developed some methods. We saw that the mathematical machinery became very involved. We needed to construct the Slater determinants. And uh, despite all of this complexity, we were still missing out some important interactions and the results were not accurate enough. What we are going to do today is to replace our quest for solving problem by finding the many body wave function, I'll replace this quest uh, with a quest for looking for a charge density, which is explicitly now shown again in this left-hand side part, where we show an isocharge surface. That means a surface with the charge with a constant charge density corresponding to this crystalline structure. Um, Essentially, we are saying that we are not interested in the uh, wave functions, which are anyway something difficult for us to grasp. Uh, we are not used from our macroscopic dimensions to think in quantum mechanical terms and uh, what happens when you uh, swap two fermionic particles that the um, wave function must change its sign, must be anti-symmetric and so on. This is not what we are used from our everyday reality. And in that way, the description of the electrons as really just a density of how many electrons we have in a certain spatial volume might be easier for us to grasp. So we will do the transition from a wave function towards charge density. Um, I'm not 100% sure that I will always use this symbol charge density consistently. It might actually refer here in the next slides to two different quantities. One would be a charge density, one would be electronic density. The difference is that if we then say N is the uh, electronic density, the charge density would be n times e 
where E is the charge of an electron, right? Um, so I might be talking about charge density or electronic density. Those are two quantities that describe the same distribution of electrons. Just one has a dimension uh, one because it describes the number of particles. The other one has a uh, dimension of charge. That means in SI units, coulombs. DFT is the well-known acronym for this theory. Once again, density functional theory. It has been awarded Nobel Prize in 1998, um, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, which was awarded to Walter Korn. And you will see later on that Walter Korn is actually behind all the key uh, papers, all the key publications in this field. Out of curiosity, uh, it's good to know that Walter Korn is an, or was an Austrian born scientist who was forced to emigrate be between uh, before the Second World War and he spent his active academic life in USA. So, before we come to the modern DFT, let us examine the path to it and the original theory which actually went in this direction was a semi cycle model by Thomas uh, by Thomas and Fermi in which they already proposed to replace the wave function formalism with electron density and we have in principle all the tools to do that as well we just need to remember some of the results from the free electron theory. Let us assume that within a certain volume, we have a constant charge density or electron density. You see here that again, I use it inconsistently, these two terms, right? So in this case, electron density. Um, we might think about the volume be so small that inside of the volume, it is fair to assume that the density is really constant. Okay? It's in fact something similar to uh, some stepwise finite element method splitting of the space. Now, if in this space, we have a certain charge density, we know how to link it with the maximum momentum of the electrons in this, uh, in, in, in corresponding to this density. We would use for that the Sommerfeld model. And in Sommerfeld model, we have derived the relationship between the uh, maximum K vector at the Fermi level, Kf, and the charge density to be 3n pi squared. And then we take the third root of that. So n is the electronic density, the charge density, the electronic density, so the uh, number of electrons per unit volume. And Kf is the maximum occupied uh, state with the longest k vector. So the K vector at the firm level. And then if we are working within the Sommerfeld model, that means with the free electron description in which we know that the K vector is directly uh, giving momentum. So momentum of our particles would be simply uh, H bar K. So then at this Fermi level, the K vector is given to the momentum at the Fermi level, and we can arrive simply to the formula we have here, which provides now charge density or electronic density in terms of the momentum at Fermi level. It also allows us to say what is the, uh, the energy density. So the energy within our 
volume corresponding to this electron density. We have uh, derived again a couple of weeks back that the total density is given by h bar squared v over 10 pi squared m kf to the power of phi. So m is the mass of an electron, v is the volume of our, um, of our specimen or of our whole simulation box um, in which we assumed a constant electronic density. And then u was the total energy of the system at zero Kelvin. So from here, we can come to the energy density. And that would be, in principle, if you look at the rest, what we have here, a certain constant. And from the relation that we have just above here, when we see that the charge density and the Fermi uh, wave vector are proportional, with uh, the power of three, we would immediately come here to the conclusion that this is n to the power of five thirds. So this is now the expression that we have here. And it is nothing else than expressing the total energy density, zero Kelvin, of course, um, as a function of the local value of the charge density. What is missing now is to express the total kinetic energy of our system. Okay? And since we have free electrons, we have no interactions in here, and the total kinetic energy is corresponding to the total energy of the system. So within the Sommerfeld model, we can then express the total kinetic energy as simply the integral of the above formula, which was the kinetic energy density over the whole simulation box, over the whole specimen volume. Right, so that is nothing else. So we basically say that within our system, we approximate the total kinetic energy with the total energy of non-interacting system at the Sommerfeld level. We can now combine this with also some interactions, some potential energies. And so what is relatively trivial is to express in this, uh, 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 in, in this terminology also the potential energy of the interaction between electrons and nuclei, where we simply integrate the product of the charge density. So that's the number of electrons, or the electronic density once again, the number of electrons per unit volume times the potential energy at that position. And we integrate this over the whole specimen. Obviously, this will give us the total potential energy of the electron nuclei interactions. Um, the Vn here describes the electrostatic potential energy, uh, the interaction of a single electron with all the remaining nuclei. We can, using the same um, approach also express the total electron electron interactions once again in this expression that we have here we recognize very similar form uh, formula that we had last week for the uh, h3 potential okay so we actually integrate here the interactions between all pairs of points in the space at each of these uh, points in the space, we have a certain number of electrons 
here we have the distance between them and then we integrate their electrostatic interaction over all of these distances. And here comes for the first time the inconsistency because if I am using here the N as the electronic density, that means the number of electrons and Probably here was already the inconsistency as well, because here it should be the charge density indeed, not unlike on the uh, previous slide. If here the N would be the electronic density, so the number of electrons we would need to have here the charge of the electrons as well. Okay. Good. What is left now is to sum everything up and we get the total energy in our system. So we sum up the kinetic energy and the two suspects for the potential energy that we have uh, in the system, the two interactions, the interactions between electrons and nuclei and electrons and electrons. I would also like to point here to these brackets that we have um, around the electronic density or charge density as you wish, N which now correspond to the fact that we speak here about functionals. You probably know what is a function. Function is a mathematical object which ascribes to a number, another number. This is typically what we uh, understand under function. We also know multidimensional functions which ascribe to a vector, a number or sometimes another vector. And functional is now another type of object which takes as an input a function and ascribes it a number in this particular case. And such object, you know, you use very intuitively without thinking about it. Use it, for example, here with the integrals, right? You plug into the integral, you put it as an input, a function, and you get a number out of it, provided we speak about the definite integrals, right? So if I give you that my uh, functional would be an integral from zero to one over, so not volume of course, but then over the whole, uh, over the x-axis. And if you plug in a function x, you get a number. In that particular case, you get a value one half. If you plug in another function sine, you get another number. Don't ask me what you get, I'm too old for this, right? Um, if you plug in another function, you get another number. So you always have the, assignment for a function that you plug in, you get a number. And this is indeed what we are doing here. We choose a function n, and n is a function of position in the space, which ascribes to each point in the space the corresponding electronic density. What we get out of all of these individual components are single numbers. This is a number which describes the total kinetic energy corresponding to my charge distribution. This is the total electron nucleus interaction that corresponds again to the same charge density. And finally, we have then the electron-electron uh, interaction, so the self-interaction corresponding again to the same distribution of the charges. When we sum up these three numbers, we get another number. We call this number total energy. And of course, this total energy, again, depends on which function, describing the distribution of charges, I choose as my input. And obviously, I can get for any function, any distribution of charge, I can get a number. And this now brings you to variational principle, how to solve the problem. If you know 
what is the total energy corresponding to your system depending on your distribution of charge. And you also know that at zero Kelvin, you are searching for so-called ground state, which means that you are searching for the lowest energy state. You are effectively searching for a function in the whole functional space, in all possible functions uh, allowed. That gives you the lowest possible energy. That gives you the lowest possible output of this, uh, of this functional. This is where the name of the whole method, again, the density functional theory comes from. The density refers to the charge density or electronic density. The functional corresponds to the fact that we express all our energy contributions as functionals of the charge density. Well, and it's theory because this is our theoretical description of how things work. The Femi Thomas theory was a great success in the sense that it was a big conceptual step towards the modern density functional theory. It has been developed in 40s. However, it was for a long time not really developed because it yielded predictions that were very wrong, very unrealistic, very inaccurate. And the reason for that is that in all these expressions that we are using here, we haven't considered any of the quantum mechanical principles, the interactions between electrons, for example, the exchange, therefore the Pauli exclusion principle. We don't have here anything about correlation at all. All our interactions are purely classical, right? We have here just the electrostatic interaction between electrons. So no quantum mechanical interactions at all. Also, our kinetic energy is approximated by the total energy of non-interacting gas at zero Kelvin. Is this fine or not? Well, most likely not, right? So the theory, the, the idea of replacing wave function with charge density has been born, but it hasn't been really developed because of these shortcomings. It hasn't been developed until mid 60s where uh, the Hornbeck and Korn formulated their theorems, which eventually led to the what we call these days a modern density functional theory or simply just density functional theory. Or if we want to acknowledge really the fathers of this theory, we often call it also Kohn Shem density functional theory. The name of Lee Shem, the scientist, will come in two slides or three slides. The, there are two theorems from Hoenberg and Kohn. The first one states that if two systems of electrons, one trapped in one potential and another trapped in another potential, and please remember these potentials describe the interactions between the electrons and nuclei. So if those two systems yield the same ground state density, then necessarily these two potentials are identical up to an additive constant. How can you imagine this? Imagine a potential as a landscape, really a landscape. You know, you maybe look outside of a window that you have here, you see the mountains around you, you see the valleys and so on. Now you take a huge amount of water and you pour it in. What will the water do? It will, of course, be very deep, very deep in deep valleys. It will be fairly, the depth will be fairly constant in Niederösterreich, in Burgenland, where, which are fairly flat. And therefore, the, let's say, landscape is flat. The density, the, the depth will be constant there. There will be uh, very large local variations when we come to Tyrol and Vollarlberg, where 
uh, we have really deep valleys. And there might be even places without any water, maybe around cross block there, right? Which would be coming out of. Now, where am I heading with this? The depth of the water is representing our charge density. The landscape, really, whether we are in Niederösterreich, whether we are in Tyrol, essentially, what are the mountains around ourselves are corresponding to the potential. That is why often in uh, also the scientific papers and, and publications, the distribution of the potential is uh, referred to as a really energy landscape. Now, imagine that we have the power and we move the landscape of Austria to Tibet, right? So you have the same mountains, the same distribution of the mountains. It's just everything's much higher. Now you take the same amount of water, that means the same number of electrons, and we pour it in. Well, obviously, the distribution of electrons will be identical because the landscape is identical no matter that it is higher. And this brings you to an intuitive understanding what this first theorem of Hornberg and Horn says. It says that if I make this footprint of my potential via the charge density, and I look at it and I get the same charge density, then the two landscapes I'm comparing must be identical in their distribution, and they must might differ only by an additive constant. Again, Austria in Europe, there is hypothetical uh, or Austria in Tibet. The consequence of this theorem is relatively big. It uh, in, uh, indicates or it implies that a state of a many body system, and that means including its wave function, is uniquely described by the charge density. Why? Well, if we say that a charge density uniquely determines the potential, and obviously the potential is the only unknown ingredients in the Hamiltonian of the Schrodinger equation, and obviously the wave function is the solution of the Schrodinger equation. So from here we come to the Hamiltonian and from here we come to the wave function. And this is where we want to be. We tend to trust into the Schrodinger equation, into the Schrodinger uh, quantum mechanics. And from the beginning we were after this quest of solving the Schrodinger equation and finding the, uh, uh, the, the wave function. Now, when we say that with the, with the charge density, we can actually yield or, or obtain the same result, that's brilliant. Because instead of looking for this many variable function, and once again, uh, just to remind you, in case of simple aluminum with 13 electrons, our wave function would be a function of 39 variables. We are now looking for a function which is no matter how many electrons we have, no matter which system we have, it's always a function of three variables, x, y, and z. So mathematically, we have hugely simplified our problem. Here we have on the left-hand side, Pierre Hohenberg, on the right hand side this is a photograph of Walter Korn. And the key paper in which they published this uh, theorem was published in FISREF uh, in 1964. So this is one of the most cited papers these days because the whole modern quantum mechanical theory relies on this, uh, on this theorem. Once again, let me put this in the, the consequence of the first Hornbeck and Korn theorem, let me put it in a, in a mathematical formulation. What we have in this equation is 
how we obtain charge density when we know the wave function. What we do is that we simply integrate over all but i's variable. What we get out of this product or of this, of this integral that we have here, this will be a probability that an electron i is at position r. And obviously then when we sum over all electrons, as we do here, we get the total probability that an electron, some electron is at this position, which corresponds to the uh, electron density. So no matter that the right-hand side of this equation is, let's say, mathematically involved, although it's just lengthy, it's uh, otherwise trivial, uh, we have a very straightforward way how to come from the wave function to the charge density. But the Hornbeck and Pond theorem says it goes the other way around. When we know the charge density, we can get essentially everything as if we had known the wave function as a much more complicated mathematical object. And I think this is something that we have to appreciate. We have to, uh, uh, we have to uh, note this really uh, strength of this theorem and its implications. And let me state here that when I'm saying it's completely identical kind of information, this is not 100% true. We actually can get uniquely the wave function up to a phase factor. So if you imagine that you take from a wave function, another wave function, which is multiplied by whatever a complex unit number, and the phi function might be any function of the variables, the positions of our electrons, then obviously the charge density will not change. In the first equation, I will get here e to minus i phi. With the second one, I get times i e to the i phi. These two cancel out each other and I arrive at exactly the same charge density. So actually, the charge density is defining the wave function uniquely up to a complex unity phase factor. This phase factor is not important uh, for our typical observables because um, it yields the same charge distribution. The wave function, which is modified by this phase factor, it's the same charge distribution, the same distribution of electrons. Before we move to the second uh, Hornbeck and Korn theorem, let us now define a universal functional or so-called Hornbeck Korn function. Functional, again, it is because we now assign to charge density one number. And this number is a sum of two energy contributions. The first one is the total kinetic energy of our electrons. So all electrons and their kinetic energy that corresponds to a given charge density. And the second part is the electron-electron interaction. If you actually think about this, this would be in the Fermi-Thomas uh, Fermi Thomas theory, these would be the two parts which do not depend on the distribution of nuclei. And they do not depend on the distribution and type of nuclei. Uh, also, in this definition, they are independent of them. And this is why we call them universal. No matter whether my charge density should correspond to aluminum, to iron, to titanium nitride. If the charge density is the same, 
the corresponding kinetic energy and electron electron interactions will be the same because in these parts of the interaction we do not know anything about the nuclei they concern only the electrons we now come to the second Hornbeck and Korn theorem which is actually what we have stated already for the Thomas Fermi theory, how to solve it or how to use it to solve our problem. We now construct a functional of the total energy, which then includes the energy contributions that correspond only to the electronic part. So purely the electrons without an interaction with the eye. And we add an, inter uh, an interaction between the electrons described by the charge density with the external field. And the external field here, uh, or in majority of applications, are simply the nuclei. So this is the electron in close interaction. We have constructed uh, the total energy functional as a sum of the universal functional and this integral being a functional again of the charge density. And we can ascribe to every possible distribution of charge, we can ascribe the value, we call this value the total energy. The second theorem of Hornbeck and Korn claims that the charge distribution the electronic distribution nr which yields the minimum value of the total energy functional corresponds to the ground state uh, energy uh, ground state distribution of electrons for our given system and the value is then the ground state energy corresponding to our solution so eventually, if we have a Hamiltonian and we search for its solution, in this Hamiltonian, we have also the kinetic energy of the electrons plus the electron-electron interactions plus the electron-nucleus interactions, which acts on a wave function. Suppose we find this uh, uh this this solution this wave function psi then n which will be psi star psi will minimize a functional that is defined exactly in this way where this first part is our electronic kinetic energy plus electron electron interactions and the second part is the electron nucleus interaction this is now very strong because it tells us how to solve the problem. It just says, try all possible distributions of electrons, try all possible electron densities, plug them in, evaluate these integrals, three integrals, uh, presumably easy or numerically, should it be easy, and then sort your uh, functions describing the possible charge distribution based on the resulting value of the total energy and pick up the one with the lowest one. Well, the trouble is that there are infinite many wave functions, uh, sorry, infinite many functions. So the space of functions is infinite dimensional. And you can, with this variational formulation, you can hardly ever be sure that what you find is the true global minimum. And if you look once again at the second Hornbeck theorem, it talks indeed about this global minimum. Only that is interpreted. And only this one is interpreted as corresponding to the solution of our quantum mechanical problem. 
So we will need to do something about this variational formulation. And this something is a method published one year after Hornbeck and Kant paper, which was published in 1964, the subsequent work by and Walter Kohn and Li Shen from 1965 allows us to use the modern density functional theory in a really recipe-like way. What we now do is that we construct a certain Hamiltonian, a Kohnian Hamiltonian, we'll talk about it in a second, which corresponds to a fictitious system of non-interacting particles. So we forget about our electrons that interact with each other electrostatically and so on. We have now a system of particles that do not interact. Okay? Remember, this is in fact the Sommerfeld model. Suppose that we have a Kohnian Hamiltonian, we have then, uh, which, which corresponds to this non-interacting system. We can solve it. We can solve it because then uh, we are talking about one particle wave functions that we are looking for. And we can construct the corresponding charge density simply by taking a number of low energy lying solutions of this one particle uh, consham equation uh, calculate their probabilities for one particles. Again, they are non-interacting, so they do not depend on each other. We sum them up depending on how many electrons we have in the system, and we get the charge density. And the Kohn-Shem approach works in that way, that they say, if for an interacting system, described with the Hamiltonian age, you construct the Korn Shem Hamiltonian in a proper way. We don't know yet how, but if you do this transition correctly, the solution to the Korn Shem orbitals is trivial, or let's say relatively simple. We can construct a charge density. This is trivial. That is exactly the formula we have here. Now they claim that if you do this first step correctly, the resulting charge density is the solution that corresponds to your Hamiltonian, your system of interacting particles. So this part was the difficult. It was very difficult when we wanted to solve directly the wave function. Okay, we said that we can simplify our life by searching for the charge density because this provides us with a way how to get the wave function. But still, we ended up with variational principle. And now we have pushed the unknown, the part that is difficult, to this first step where we say, okay, for a given Hamiltonian, there will be a recipe which allows us to construct a different Hamiltonian. You, know, you just put it in your machine and you get out another, um, another functional. And this uh, another Hamiltonian or another operator, this Hamiltonian operator corresponds to a system of non-interacting particles. That means their solution is simple in the sense that if we talk about single particle wave functions, we have methods how to do this. Then if we find these solutions, we can construct a charge density that is absolutely trivial step. And if all of these steps were done correctly, the final charge density is the one that you were looking for. Knowing the charge density, we know the wave function and we are done, we can go home. So where is the catch? There's always a catch, right? Nothing comes for free. Well, the catch is not that I move to the beginning of our lecture. The 
the catch is that we realize what are the terms in this con shem Hamiltonian. The con shem can, I, can I say it sounds like you're describing failure with extra steps. So, sorry, say again. Said it, it sounds like you're uh, just describing failure with extra steps. That is true. That is true. <laughs> yeah, we we are we are sort of postponing our failure. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that 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 is true. And indeed, this is in fact what what we are doing, right? And we will we will see very soon that uh, we started with an exact formulation that we are, however, unable to solve mathematically, and we are trying to reformulate it and and. Uh, um, rewrite our equations in a way that we believe we can handle but there are always some hidden corners uh, because the fact that we started with an equation that we can't solve we fail to solve uh, is hardly to be solved by just rewriting the equation there will be really a reason why we cannot do that mm -hmm. but the reason for why we are failing to solve the many body Schrodinger equation which we typically say it's because the wave function is too complicated, we will now see that it comes to certain uh, really physical reasons that we are unable to describe explicitly some interactions between electrons. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that clarify it a little bit or? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thanks. So for the Kornsham Hamiltonian, we have now following four terms. We have kinetic energy again, for the particles. And these are single particles, so non-interacting. So we have actually the term, the identical term that we would have in uh, the Sommerfeld model. We then add a hard tree potential, uh, which should plug in the electrostatic uh, contribution for the interaction between the electrons. We then plug in the interactions between the electrons and uh, nuclei, so that's all fine. And now we have there one additional term, one additional term, Xc, and I'm not going to make here a very long mystery, this is the exchange correlation potential. So we have met already the exchange potential in our formulation of um, the uh, Hartree-Fock method. We have also said that the deficiency of the Hartree-Fock method was the omission of the correlations. And so we are now putting all of these interactions, which mean all of these interactions in this last term in the exchange correlation potential. And if we now look at the structure of this Kornsham Hamiltonian, we can relatively easily understand the origins, the physical origins of these contributions. We can also see that, in fact, the first three terms are exactly the terms that we would have in the uh, uh, Sommerfeld model, and then adding the interactions via the Hartree interactions, eventually that correspond to classical electrostatic interactions. And all the quantum mechanical effects make it kind of difficult for the solution. That's why we need to have all this uh, Schrodinger equation and so on. They are now going to be outsourced in this UXC, in the exchange correlation potential. If someone comes to you and tells you, all right, this is the form of the exchange correlation potential, you are all set. Right. From exchange correlation, you know how to formulate the Kornsham Hamiltonian, you know how to get the um, orbitals for the non interacting system, you know how to get the charge density, and eventually you know how to get the wave function that you were looking for, or maybe you'd be happy with the charge density. The trick is. In this exchange correlation potential, we have discussed the exchange already. 
a bit before. What is the mathematical or, or what is the uh, physical origin of that? Uh, that it comes from the uh, Pauli exclusion principle and the uh, repulsion, Pauli repulsion between uh, oppositely oriented spins. It eventually causes magnetic ordering. So if you have no exchange energy, we have no magnetic ordering of, of systems. The correlation is something that we have neglected so far. It was not in the Slater determinant. And uh, to give you some idea where does this come in the game, if you have two random variables in statistics, and they are uncorrelated in the sense that they do not depend on each other, then a probability of first and second or, uh, event to happen is simply the product of the two probabilities. The probability that I have a well-prepared lecture and the probability of even that it's raining outside are uncorrelated events. A low probability of well-prepared lecture times looking from outside, high probability that it might rain soon will be simply a product of these two probabilities. If you now take two events, when you say you have a probability of that it's going to rain soon and another statistical event which says I wear an umbrella, these are probably correlated events. So I cannot simply calculate the probability of both of these events happening at the same time as the simple product. I'll be missing here the correlation of those two variables. Now, looking again at this formula, it reminds you maybe of the product ansatz in which we said that we will express our total wave function as a product of two individual wave functions. And of course, then when we come from psi to the probability, we'll come also from the individual phi's to the probability of the first particle and the second particle identically. And we will then get it for the uh, systems that can be well described with this product answer. We actually get that the total probability is the probability one times the probability two, which means we have uncorrelated system. So this product answer that was all coded in into the Hartree and Hartree for, uh, approximations, genuinely, uh, does not allow for inclusion of these correlated systems. And this is the kind of interaction uh, that we will now include in this exchange and correlation. The problem is how to get this exchange correlation potential. And uh, one of you has uh, very correctly stated this, that we are uh, always pushing away our failure. And the failure is that we do not know, we are failing to derive an analytical formula for the exchange correlation for that potential. Despite the fact that we know the potential is related to the exchange correlation energy, we are failing to provide a formula that would allow you to say, this is the exchange correlation energy. Right? We don't know that, and that is, the, that is the problem. So eventually, we are now knowing that part of the reason that we are failing to solve our many-body wave function problem is related to the fact that we are failing to describe analytically and in all detail all our quantum mechanical interactions between these parties. And so we need to come up with certain approximations. And I will just very briefly list here two of them, LDA and GGA, local density approximation and generalized gradient approximation. 
which are the most common ones being used in the modern applications. <coughs> Excuse me. What they do is that they provide an approximation for the exchange correlation potential density, which you um, approximate by uh, a function that depends only on the value of the charge density in that given space. So from actually here, uh, we should have, right, uh, from, from the fact that we have, um, right, uh, from the fact that uh, we would have the exchange correlation functional as a functional of function of the charge distribution, we now express it uh, using some approximative function that takes as an input only the value of the charge density at a given space, uh, at a given place, and then we simply integrate it over the whole volume. In the case of gradient approximation, our approximation for the exchange correlation potential takes two values as an input. It takes at each place the value of the charge density plus its gradient. So eventually this will allow for distinguishing between uh, systems in which we have homogeneous charge density, in which we have fast changing charge density, uh, in which we have different perturbations and so on. Neither of these are exact exchange correlation potentials, exchange correlation functionals. Both of these, LDA and GGA, are approximations. This is important to know. Moreover, there exist different flavors. That means different parametrizations of these approximations. And of course, there uh, exist also different further developments which include hybrid functionals in which we might also try to mix in, for example, some exact exchange on the Hartree-Fock level, uh, right, Hartree-Fock level. Uh, we might uh, try to uh, mix in some additional contributions for the kinetic energy, some meta-GGA uh, exchange correlation potentials, and so on and so forth. With those, the calculations become heavier and heavier, presumably more and more accurate. And it's always uh, a balance where you need to figure out uh, how accurate approximation you need against some benchmark problem um, in uh, order to describe well your problem. So from being desperate, of not being able to solve the Schrodinger equation for many body system. We got a great hope with the density functional theory in which we said, well, now it all looks much, much simpler. We are describing just, char just charge distribution. Um, and uh, we formulate everything using this Consham Hamiltonian in a recipe like way. Uh, there are probably not any more any functional, uh, any variational principles and all looks very nice. When we ended up again, a little bit sad, saying that we have to rely on an approximation, approximation uh, of the quantum mechanical interactions. Despite this may be a little bit depressing take home message, it is good to also note that the LDA and GGA approximations or the beyond those exchange correlation functionals, hybrid functionals and so on, they do very, very decent job. They allow for description of almost, in, in, in an almost parameter-free way, uh, many material properties. They allow us to actually use the quantum mechanical calculations in engineering and material science applications. And uh, in fact, 
as of today, this is the most accurate and uh, let's say consistent over the periodic table method that is available. Right. So uh, don't be misled with the message that uh, at the end of the day, we have to rely on approximations. And one message may be here, even if we say we have to make the approximation, this approximation will be identical over the whole periodic table because we don't do any approximation on the electron nucleus interaction part. We do this approximation only on the electron-electron interactions. Right? So eventually, uh, if we have better or worse description of this exchange correlation, that means no matter which material system we take in the game, we make systematically the same type of an error. And it still allows us to extract fairly accurate material trends. On this slide, I'm showing just the way how we proceed with the calculation. So we need to have a certain charge density to start with. And this uh, charge density is needed in order to construct the potential. All Hartree external potential as well as the exchange correlation potentials, they all depend on the distribution of the charge. They were all functionals of the charge density. So we need to have some starting guess. And the possible guess is, for example, a superposition of the uh, charge densities of isolated atoms that we have in our system of interest. These can be solved explicitly using the many-body Schrodinger equation. So let's say we start from here. We have a starting charge density. We construct the effective potential, which we then plug in into the Korn sham equation, get the Korn sham orbitals from which we can calculate the charge density. And then we just look whether our charge density differs from the one that we had at the beginning of our cycle. If it does differ a lot, we continue with the cycle. Again, use now the newly calculated charge density to calculate the effective potential, solve the quantum equations, get a new charge density again and again, or uh, compare it with the one we had at the beginning of the cycle. For numerical reasons, we do not take typically the resulting charge density completely, but instead we mix it with the old one. So we are sort of slowing down the convergence a little bit, but uh, by gaining more stability of this self-consistency cycle. And once we are done with the charge density, we say we are happy with it, it doesn't change anymore. We continue with using this charge density to evaluate material properties of interest that correspond to this charge density. So with this, we would have a description of our electronic system. In fact, that means we have solved the uh, corresponding Schrodinger equation. In practice, this is done by matrix eigenvalue problem. And uh, I will not go here too much into detail. If you're interested, I will then uh, suggest that you maybe sign up for the atomistic modeling lecture that we have in the winter term. The machinery under the hood is that we have now transformed the quantum mechanical problem, Schrodinger, problem, uh, Schrodinger equation, which is the partial many body differential equation. We have transferred into once again, linear algebraic system with a system of linear equations, which we need to solve. So all of those of you who were in love with matrices, you will be in love in principle with the quantum mechanical problems. Those of you who hate it, you do not have to worry about it too much because for majority of the cases, this is coded in the available software these days. And it's good to know that this is how it works under the hood. Eventually, the reason why the 
density functional theory or quantum mechanical calculations take very long is because of the linear algebra that we need to linearize really large matrices. So what can be calculated? Eventually, we can calculate different structural properties, including uh, elastic properties, uh, elasticity. We can de uh, describe defects from point defects also to, let's say, planet defects, uh, even dislocations. We can think about uh, dislocation dynamics because once we have the charge density, we can use it to get the forces acting on atoms and we are back to our description of the phonons we had at the beginning of the course. Well, we can also uh, look a little bit closer into the uh, chemistry and try to extract some information about the bonds and the charge density itself, the type of bonding, whether we have some charge transfer, ionic bonding, how the orbitals the bonds look like. Um, we will be also able to discuss spectroscopic properties, we can predict them, uh, such things uh, as uh, electron energy loss spectra. We can also describe, for example, absorption and optical spectra, um, calculate the electric functions and so on and so forth. And all of those then can be used for explaining the experimentally measured trends, tendencies, where do individual peaks appear, where you expect them, whether your understanding of the material and its behavior is correct or not. Once again, if you are interested a bit more in this, uh, in details of how the DFT works under the hood, as well as in some hands-on sessions, I strongly recommend this lecture that is being given in the winter term. All right. So that brings me to the end of today's lecture. I will not go through it here uh, in detail because we have discussed this a lot, but uh, basically remember that density functional theory is a concept that transforms the many body wave function to the charge density. Uh, you say, yeah, mathematically, this is much easier instead of many body wave function, many body function that we are looking for we are no matter what system we are looking for three dimensional uh, three variable function. Um, this has been based on the Fermi Thomas theory, which well was conceptually great step uh, forward. It badly failed because of its assumptions, and this was the case until the mid sixties, where Hornberg and Horn formulated their functionals, which finally led to the formulation of Kornschem equations quantum Hamiltonian. And despite the fact that this looks brilliant, it still leads and uh, sort of uh, outsources the trouble that we had at the beginning with the Schrodinger equation. It outsources it now into the exchange correlation potential, which looks just like three letters, UXC in the quantum Hamiltonian. However, the trouble with this is that unlike the other terms in the Hamiltonian, we don't know its analytical form explicitly. We don't know it. We can't express it and we need to approximate it. Typical approximations are LDA and GGA, local density approximation or generalized gradient approximation of the charge density. So both of these take the charge density, plug it into some approximative functionals and provide you with the corresponding exchange correlation amount. All right, so this is it. Um, do you have any questions to the density functional theory? Um, yeah, only for my own clarification. Uh, the, so the cone sham Hamiltonian sort of imitates the real Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian by use, by, uh, changing the terms so that uh, makes some of the terms easily solvable because they are uh, classically treated. And the rest is the exchange correlation potential exactly. or the terms relating to the exchange correlation potential. Yes, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. but uh, for all of density functional theory, the uh, 
how did you call it the potential landscape mm -hmm. the the nuclei are mm -hmm. unknown and this is no 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 the the nuclei landscape this is known right yeah so what is unknown is the electron electron interactions mm -hmm. right so the distribution of where are my ions what kind of ions are there this is this is uh, given and this is effectively described at the classical level at the uh, point charge interactions because we yeah. always treat the nuclei as point charges with a given number of protons right? mm -hmm. so this is always in the external potential uh, effectively as uh, as point or as potentials corresponding to point charges yeah okay good I thought so. So the V1 and V2 in the first uh, Kohn Shem, uh, sorry, Kohn Hohenbeck uh, theorem, that would refer to the distribution of ions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, then the electron electron interactions that are also including the exchange correlation. This is always the same. That is then hidden or, or hidden contained, let's say, in this universal functional because this is no matter which uh, charge density you take and despite the fact that we say that we don't know exactly this exchange correlation we know from the universality of this that it's always the same no matter which landscape you take mm -hmm. right so again in this in this uh, universal functional, that contains the exchange correlation. In the electron-electron part of that, we have the exchange correlation. 